We're exploring the most scandalous message ever lived out. And it was lived out by the person that we all know, Jesus. Jesus was one of those the most scandalous individuals. And you're wondering, well, what do I mean by that? Well, he caused outrage. His, his message caused division. Yes, he brought peace, but he also brought division and and he said some really radical out there things that really made the message that he represented scandalous by nature and Paul the apostle who we often will be speaking from in this series his teachings I mean made up you know uh, the majority of the New Testament was written by Paul the apostle who had an encounter here's this guy who is super hyper-religious. I mean, he was like the most religious guy out there. He was so religious, he was killing Christians. That's how religious he was. That was his assignment. And he trained with one of the smartest individuals in that area who was a scholar. And, and this guy, Paul, probably was being raised up and trained to be the next high priest. And so you got to understand that the teachings that we're going to be exploring that come from Paul, inspired by God, we have to get a little bit of a context for the conduit from, which, from, from where this message came from. Okay, Paul had a, had a, had a mandate from God to preach the gospel to the Gentiles which is everybody outside of the Jewish people that had rejected the gospel, had rejected Jesus' message. And so understanding that, it's going to give us a little bit more context. Paul, obviously we know he didn't stay hyper-religious. He didn't stay a murderer of Christians. In Acts chapter 9, we see his journey really began where he had an encounter on the road to Damascus. He had an encounter on the road to Damascus, and uh, he got knocked off his horse. He was struck blind for three days, and a voice spoke out of the clouds saying, you know, Paul, Paul, you know, why are you persecuting me? Like, why, I'm the wrong, I'm the wrong person. You're, you're doing it the wrong way. And Paul had a revelation and an encounter that changed everything for him. Sometimes you have to go blind to the things of your past for a season so you could see with the eyes of your heart. So he had to get struck blind for three days. He had to learn to see with different eyes in those three days. And how many know that sometimes to escape from where you're from and what used to govern you and dictate you, sometimes you need to go blind a little bit. You need to stop seeing and putting your eyes on the way that you used to see it so that you can develop an internal sight. You with me? So Paul wrote two-thirds of the New Testament. Very important we understand that. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, he wrote a letter to the church at Corinth. In verse 23, he says this, But we tell a different story. We proclaim a crucified Jesus... God's anointed. For the Jews, this is scandalous. Everyone say scandalous. For the religious system, this is the most scandalous, uh, 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 earth-shattering message they're ever going to hear. I'm about to flip the, their whole world upside down. I'm about to, all that they had relied on, which was the law of sin and death, the law that had guided them, that was given to them in the wilderness, that created religion, I'm about to basically dismantle. I'm about to dismantle the whole thing. In fact, I've come to fulfill the requirements that the law demanded that man could never fulfill, and I'm going to introduce something even better. It's called the new covenant. Yeah, the old covenant, it was called the ministry, it was called this, the ministry of condemnation. But the new covenant, it's the ministry of reconciliation. And so I'm going to move and shift the tables from condemnation to reconciliation. I am going to pay the price and sin, all of our junk, all of humanity's junk, past, present, and future, would be punished in my body one day on a cross one last time. So no other sacrifice will ever have to be made. You with me? Okay, no other sacrifice will ever have to be made. For the Jews, this message is scandalous. And for the outsiders, all those that rely on in, 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 the, in today's modern culture, it would be like all the trendy people that want to figure it out up here, it's going to sound super moronic. For the Jews, it's scandalous because I'm turning the table. I'm, I'm, I'm dismantling your whole system. I'm fulfilling. I'm, dis, I'm changing the whole game. And for everybody else on the outside, for all the trendy cool cats out there that want to figure out everything up here and, and, and want to understand it, it's foolishness. It's, it's outlandish. It's moronic by nature. 
He represented something so scandalous. And so last week, if you were here, we talked about, uh, we spoke from the subject, it's too good to be true, because the message of Jesus that he brought is too good to be true. It's kind of like a MLM, you know, it's just too good to be true. Rich in 30 days, you know. Uh, uh, anybody? And all the people that are in MLMs, and you're all mad at me right now. But, um, but it's, it's, it, it's kind of like a, the promise of an MLM. And the whole premise was, I, I talked about, how the message of, the, of salvation out of Revelation says that it began, it already had happened before the foundation of the earth began. You remember that? That the Lamb of God, Jesus, was slain before the foundation of the earth. So think about it. The message, the plan of redemption had already happened before humanity ever even needed redemption. Because man knew, or God knew, that man would make the mistake. God knew, God knows what you're going to do. God's never upstairs surprised at what you do. God's never thinking in his mind, I did not know that was going to happen. Then you think, well, does that mean we're all just robots with no free will? No, we have a free will, but God knows what you're going to choose before you choose it. <laughs> and the whole premise was it, it, it was fixed all along. That, that the plan of redemption, like I said, was from the beginning. It was already done. It was already done. Your plan, your restoration, your reconciliation was already done. You were born into this world. The only thing that you are predestined for in life, the only thing. Say it with me. The only thing. <laughs> the, the only thing. The only thing. I got to get used to that. The only thing is, the only thing that you're predestined for is to be adopted into God's family as a son. That's the only thing. That really is the only thing. You want to talk about predestination? Ephesians is very clear. You've been predestined to be adopted into the family of God. You've been predestined. So you're on a journey right now searching what is truth. Well, let me just tell you this. The truth that you're on the search for is you finding yourself as a son in God's kingdom. You finding yourself as a daughter in God's kingdom. You finding yourself as part of the family of God. So that was last week. But this week I want to speak out of Romans 8. Let's go there. Let's go there. Track with me here because I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be giving you a lot of scripture today. And, and I, I know this is going to be a little bit heavier, but I can't escape this. I feel like God, God's people, the people in this house need to hear, need to have, take it on a little bit of a journey. This, In fact, this series, this series probably if not is, the most important series that you will hear all year. Because this will shape your entire perspective of who Jesus is. This series will shape your entire... In fact, this series is like the 101 of life. Life with God. If you don't have these, these foundational truths into your life as a believer, then you will miss the whole point of why you're called to do what you're called to do, living in relationship with Jesus on this earth. Romans 8 verse 1 says, therefore, everyone say therefore. therefore. Now, we have to understand, therefore is very significant because he's bringing things from Romans 7 to a close. Romans 7, we know, maybe we don't know, let me tell you, Romans 7 is the whole passage where Paul talks about the struggle with his nature, his old nature. Okay, those of you who know the, the word, know Romans 7. The things that I want to do, I do not do. And the things I don't want to do, I end up doing. We know that, right? And, and often people misguided, reading it out of context, actually think, okay, we still have an old nature to deal with, to battle with. Paul, in context, is actually referring to when he used to be living under the law of sin and death. You see, the Bible says in 1 Corinthians 15 that the strength of sin is the law. The law is what actually empowers sin to continue in your life because it keeps, keeps pointing out all of your faults over and over and over again, okay? So track with me. So Romans 7, Paul is talking about his struggle with his old man and things I want to do, I don't do, things I don't want to do, I do do. What a wretched man I am, he says. But he's talking about the old way, the ministry of condemnation that he used to live under as a pre-Christian. It, 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 it was impossible. He, he, couldn't, he couldn't fulfill the requirements of the law. He couldn't do it. So then he says in Romans 8, therefore, therefore, because once there was condemnation, and therefore now, listen to this, there is no condemnation. Say it with me. No condemnation. Therefore, there is now no condemnation no guilty verdict, no punishment. I'm reading it out of the Amplified. What is the Amplified? It just amplifies the words, okay? 
No guilty verdict, no punishment. For those who are in Christ Jesus. So what does this say? There is no condemnation. Say it again, no condemnation. You're not condemned anymore. You have no condemnation. There is no condemnation for those who are in Christ. So if you are in relationship with Jesus right now, there is no condemnation. So when you feel shame, you know you're under condemnation. When you feel fear, you know you're under condemnation. Now chalk with me here. It says in verse four, uh, 2, for the law of the spirit of life, which is in Christ Jesus, the law of our new being, has set you free from the law of sin, uh, law of sin and of death. For the, what the law could not do, okay, which is, that is overcome sin and remove its penalty and its power, being weakened by the flesh, man's nature without the Holy Spirit, God did. He sent his own son in the likeness of sinful man as an offering for sin. Now listen to this. He condemned sin in the flesh of his own son. He didn't condemn his own son. He condemned our sin in his body. So it would be an offering so it would set us free from sin eternally. This is why it's good news. Too good to be true, right? Scandalous. You mean we don't have to work for it? You mean, you, mean, you mean it's no longer about fulfilling a bunch of requirements? Exactly. It's too good to be true. That's why it was so scandalous to the Jews. They couldn't handle it. And here's this guy, the Messiah that they had been waiting for, was prophesied about for thousands of years looking like us. And this is the guy. I mean, this guy's from Nazareth. I mean, we saw his, his diapers get changed. I mean, like, what good could come out of Nazareth, this small town, and not, not Nazareth? And, and, and they, doubted, they, they doubted him because they couldn't handle the package. They couldn't handle the package. They thought he was supposed to be coming on, like, chariots and gold, gold horses and, and robes of righteousness. And he was to present himself like this extravagant king, this beautiful king. And, and yet he comes out of like as a lowly individual born in Bethlehem, born in a manger, born in a, in a place where sheep are born. It was messy. It was gr gross. And how, how could this be? How could this be? So it says here uh, in verse 4, so that the righteous and just requirements. So what, what was condemned? Sin, sin, not him, sin, okay, sin was condemned in the body of Jesus, punished in the body of Jesus for our freedom. So that, this is what it says in verse 4, so that the righteous and just requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who do not live our lives in the ways of the flesh, but live our lives in the ways of the spirit guided by his power. Write this down if you're taking notes. Attacking the fruit, attacking the fruit. Attacking the fruit by dealing with the root. We're going to deal with some roots today. You know that every fruit comes by a root. Every fruit of your life, whether it's good or bad. So we have two kinds of fruits, okay? We have fruit cakes. No, we have fruit. We have good fruit. We have Holy Spirit fruit, okay? And we have the fruit that comes by the curse. Two kinds of fruit. Say it with me. Two kinds of fruit. Fruit that comes by the curse, comes by the, the condemnation, where the law says you can't do it, you'll never make it, you're not good enough, you're not worthy, the shame, the guilt that comes with all of that. There is fruit from that, and there's fruit that comes by the Holy Spirit. Have you ever seen a branch on a tree working itself to bear fruit? Outside. Like, think about outside right now. Have you ever seen a branch, like, working itself? Like, oh, like oh, come on, fruit, fruit, fruit. No, you don't see that, right? You know how fruit, you know how fruit is produced on a branch, by simply the branch staying connected to the vine, which connects to the root systems, which receives all the sap and nutrients the branch needs to produce the fruit. It's called the overflow, the byproduct of connection. When we are connected to the wrong belief systems, we will manifest that type of fruit. I said a few weeks ago that what you believe about God will determine what you experience of God. And so if you believe wrongly about God, God is his angry, wrathful father, then you will probably live a life of fear. And every time you come into church, you feel like church is simply a moment for you to reconcile yourself back to God because you're so unworthy during the week that you can't, there's no way you could talk to him. You got to wait till you're in a holy place like this in a room full of hypocrites because we're all hypocrites. At some level, no one's perfect in this room. No one, no, one may, no, one, no one keeps all our New Year's resolutions. You're all a bunch of hypocrites. Okay? So, sorry. 
So, so uh, let, me, let, me, let, me, let me jump into this. I'm going to jump into this. You get my point. If we want to produce the fruit, we need to have a healthy root. We need to have a healthy fruit. And I think that a lot of us spend so much time attacking the fruit in our life. We try, we try to be more patient. It's like the branch trying to produce fruit. which We try to be more patient, right? We try to be more self-controlled. So if I can just put this new discipline into my life and it's going to, it's going to protect me and it's going to keep me from, from, uh, from being out of control. And so if I want to produce what Galatians says about the fruit of the Spirit, I'm going to put the system into my life to, to, to uh, encourage or to produce this type of fruit. And we, all, we have all these ideas and ways we want to produce fruit. But let me just tell you the truth. You will never produce fruit until you're connected to the right belief system and to the right source. As long as you stay connected to the wrong root, you will always produce rotten fruit. And you'll wonder why you can't kick this addiction, why you can't kick this anxiety, why you can't kick this, this fear, why you can't kick this, this and that. You'll always produce, let me, let me show you Galatians 3. Let me show you Galatians 3. I'm building on something here, okay? But those who depend on the law to make them right with God are under what? Those that depend on a system of safety to make you more holy on a system of safety this is really the five the totality of the first five books of the bible which they call the torah the mosaic law and the ten commandments unless we have a system of safety to to keep fruit happening okay then we can't make it we're trying to rely on our works on our doings but you're not called a human doing you're called a human being So see, the, 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 the law was centered entirely around your works, around the human doing. If I just do right, then I will be right. But the gospel, the scandalous message of the gospel is that if you be right, you'll do right. And to be right, you have to believe right. The first two letters in the word believe is what? That was really good. That was really good. The first two letters. You have to be to believe. Now, follow me here. But those who depend on the law to make them right with God are under his curse. Every time you depend on a system, especially in this context, the system to make you right, to, 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 to provoke you to, it's all about my effort. It's all about my good works, to be right, to be righteous, to be holy. Every time you put that pressure on you, you stand condemned already. And you'll start to live, you'll start to live out the fruits of the curse that were already dismantled on the cross. I said this before, I keep saying it over and over again. The only way the enemy can tempt you is to get you to believe something that's not true. The only authority the enemy has, because on the cross the Bible says that every power and principality was disarmed on the cross. So if the enemy, the unseen world of darkness around you has been stripped of all of its authority, that means the only way that it has authority is if you give it authority by believing it has authority. And when you believe that it has authority, you start to live and exhibit fruits that don't even exist in your life. I would venture to say that so many of all of our problems in this room are simply the fruits that come from a, a, us believing a lie about ourselves. That's why we sing songs like, I am who you say I am. I am who you say. Why? Because who God says you are will liberate you to become who you're called to be. But those who depend on the law to make them right with God are under his curse. Now let's slip over to verse 13. But Christ has rescued us from the curse. So if we... It's very easy for us to go back there by believing that he never really paid the price. By believing that we have to pay the price. And when we go back there, we stop believing. But it says in verse 13, But Christ has rescued us from the curse pronounced by the law. Under the law of condemnation, you will exhibit A, B, and C. Under the law of the spirit of life, you will exhibit Galatians 5. I'll get there in a second. Are you tracking with me now? Galatians 5, verse 22. I told you I was teaching a little bit. 
Okay, so you're on a journey with me. Verse 5, Galatians 5, verse 22. But the Holy Spirit produces. Does it say you produce? Huh. Humans produce. No, it says the Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit in our lives. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. There is no law against these things. There is no law against these things. So under the curse, you have certain kinds of fruit. But under the Spirit of God, letting Him be connected to the right belief systems that He sets you free, this kind of fruit begins to happen. So no longer is it about you producing something. It's about Him producing something through you because you're connected right. I believe this is going to set you free. I, I really believe this. This has been ministering to my heart all week because this is the type of message that you have to remind yourself over and over again. Like Jesus instituted some, some things before he left, like, like communion, for example. Do this in remembrance of me. Let it be a daily thing every day. Remind yourself of what I've done because it's so easy to forget, you guys. And when we forget, we go back under the old way of doing things. Right? That's why some of us were good for a season, Right? And, we're, and it's awesome. It's amazing. We're on the mountaintop and we forget how good God is. And when something bad happens, life shifts. We have an excuse as to why. Well, I have an excuse why I don't go to the gym now. Why I'm not eating healthy in this season. Why I'm, I'm treating my, my wife badly. I, I'm stressed. Or why I'm not being a good parent. We have an excuse. And we revert back. We forget the goodness of God in those seasons to help us overcome the hard seasons. And we, we forget. We, we actually put ourselves under some bondage that doesn't even exist doesn't even exist in our lives. So the curse has fruit. The curse has fruit. I want to put up a, a slide. The curse. The, the, these are some of the, 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 the fruits. If you, if you look at the, the fruits on the green, on the green, those are the fruits of the curse. Now, I, there's tons of fruit uh, uh, of the curse. And a lot of us, how many would venture to say, we live this out. We live this out. We live relational dysfunction right? We live poverty. We have poverty mindsets. Like, I'm not worthy of anything good. Like, I just have to suffer. I gotta, I gotta suffer. I'm taking on the vow of Mother Teresa. I gotta, I gotta, I gotta suffer. I gotta suffer for Jesus. It's suffering. It's, it's, it's struggle. It's hard. And then we have sickness. We have unforgiveness, poisonous thoughts, addictions, anxiety, hatred, bitterness, self-righteous, shame, and, and bad coffee. Bad coffee. This is the fruit of the curse. But, but, but this is the thing. We have so much talk about dealing with the fruit. You will never conquer and deal with the fruit if you don't deal with the root. The fruit is only a byproduct of a bad root system. And I want to bring you down three levels this morning. Three levels, okay? Give me a little second here. <laughs> Can I, I'm, used, I'm not used to that. It's... it's, it's tweaking my mind. Stress, okay, stress is one of the main causes of sickness in our life. I mean, it's a proven fact. It's science. There's some studies that have, that have been done in the U.S. that say over 70% of all sickness have some trace back towards stress because there's healthy stress, right? Like a healthy stress is like the butterflies you feel in your stomach when you're going on your first date, right? Like a healthy stress, right? And then there's chronic stress, where you just hate your life, you hate your job, like you just, you can't escape. There's no break of stress. There's a chronic stress that has the ability, I mean, people always say it, I mean, uh, headaches and, 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 and migraines and pains in parts of your body and, and, and your heart is directly connected to some of this stuff. In one study, for example, that was done, there was a, a journal written, it was called the Journal of Pain, okay? And it, and it was written in 2007, by a guy named Thorne, okay? Now, I want to read this to you. In one study, for example, about half the participants saw improvements in chronic headaches after learning how to stop the stress-producing habit of catastrophizing, or, co which is, or constantly thinking negative thoughts about their pain. So they were in this constant state of everything was a catastrophe. Everything was like a problem. Everything was a struggle. And they, they worked themselves so much in distress, anxiety in their mind, spinning around like they just can't do it. And all of a sudden now these chronic, he these chronic headaches would come into their life. And they noticed when they started to deal with that, these chronic headaches started to leave. 
You with me? Chronic stress may also cause disease, either because of changes in your body or the overeating, smoking, and other bad habits people use to cope with stress. Maybe high job, high demands at your job, job strain. A lot of these things can be tied to an increased risk of coronary disease. I mean, you can read tons of different journals and articles online about the studies that have been done to link stress with sickness and, and, and stress with a lot of these other things because a lot of these other things actually can shift back to sickness. When you're under financial stress over and over again, relational dysfunction, it has the power to so stress you out, it affects your body. But we want to all deal with the peripherals. We all want to deal with the fruit. But unless you go down past the fruit and start dealing with the things at the root, you'll never be free. You'll never be free. Now, stress stems from fear. Let's go down one level. Stress stems from fear. Fear, okay, all of a sudden, oh my gosh, like I can't pay my bill. You get, a, you get a bill in the mill. I can't pay my bill. I don't have enough money. Look at our account. Honey, look at our account. We're not going to be able to pay it. You get stressed from the fear. You know what I'm talking about. Fear of, oh my, my, my gosh, my spouse is going to cheat, uh, he's, he's gonna, he's gonna, he's gonna cheat on me, or my wife's going to cheat on me, or I'm going to lose my kids in a car accident. I don't want my kids to go anybody, with, with anybody but me and drive with anybody but me. I don't want to have a babysitter because something bad happens. And we go into fear, right? Stress. Stress. Sickness, dysfunction, discord, disunity in the family, division, fear. Now, you're wondering, okay, so where is the biblical precedent for this? Let me show you something. Because it was fear that hit Adam in the garden. Watch this. Genesis 3, verse 7. At the moment, so the moment. Now, in this time, let me just bring some, some clarity to something. In this time, remember this, there was two trees in the garden. One that represented grace, the tree of life. They were both in the middle of the garden. So imagine a garden and in the middle, in the midst, was two choices. Life and death. The tree of life, which represented God's grace, freedom, eternity. You eat off that tree, you live forever. And then the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. There was no consciousness of sin at this point. But God gave an opportunity for man to make their own choice of free will. So on the knowledge of the tree and good, many scholars would believe that the fruit that Eve saw, she said, I saw that, that it was fruit to make one wise. Like I want that kind of wisdom. Even though God said I cannot eat off that tree and if I do I'll surely die. I want it. These, this fruit was beautiful. Most scholars believe that it was probably figs. And the reason being, because the very next thing that happened when they made the choice was they took a fig leaf and hid themselves. Very important we understand that as we read into the New Testament. Now, track with me, verse 7, Genesis 3. At that moment, their eyes were opened and they suddenly felt shame at their nakedness. So they sewed fig leaves together to cover themselves. When the cool evening breezes were blowing, the man and his wife heard the Lord God walking about in the garden. So they what? They hid, right? Fear will always cause you to hide from the Lord God from among the trees. Verse 9. The Lord God called to man and said, where are you? Remember, whenever God asks where you are or what's up, what you're doing, it's not because he doesn't know the answer. He wants you to acknowledge your position in life. It's part of confessing. Confess where you're at so I can come in and change the game for you. Okay? Verse 10, he replied, Adam replies, I, or God, I, or Adam, sorry, I heard you walking in the garden so I... Help me. I hid. Why did he hide? He was afraid. So you see, fear will always hide you. It will hide you from what God has for you. When you are in fear, stress begins to become the byproduct, the first type of fruit. And from stress are created so many of these other fruits that don't even belong to us, that are not produced by the Holy Spirit in our life. Now let me just tell you this, sin, sin, in that moment, it did not separate God from man. It separated man from God. Very different. It's not just semantics. 
God was not like, oh my gosh, where are they? Oh my gosh, where are they? Oh my gosh, I can't see them. I can't see them. I can't see them. I can't see them. Where are they? Oh, oh my gosh, we're in trouble. The people that I made, they're just gone. They're just... People, 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 people misread context all the time. No, it was us that hid ourselves. God didn't hide himself. He didn't go anywhere. In fact, David even said, if I make my bed, we hide ourselves out of shame. We take on the fruits of the curse by believing wrong. We feel like we have to hide. We feel, let me read you to Isaiah 59 verse 1. Surely the arm of the Lord is not too short to save, nor his ear too dull to hear. But your iniquities have separated you from your God. Your issue, your junk, the junk in your trunk, you got so ashamed, you hid yourself behind a fig leaf because of fear, because of condemnation. Now let me bring you down another level. At the very core of fear is, condem go back to the slide, condemnation. This is the very thing that Paul has to deal with if he's going to set us free from wrong mindsets that are robbing us from living out the scandalous message of the gospel. He's got to deliver us in this moment. He's got to bring us down a level. I'm telling you, everybody in this room at the core of who we are battle at some level without even realizing it, the feeling of condemnation. I'm not good enough. I'm a failure. I'm not worthy enough. God doesn't love me. See, I'm being punished. You see this bad thing's happening? I'm reaping what I sowed. You see? You see? And that, that brings fear. Fear. God, it's never going to change. I'm, I'm never going to get through this. You see? I told you. And then stress. And then and everything gets, starts to get into, into disarray. And then you're drinking bad coffee in the morning. You're wondering why you're going to the washroom 10,000 times a day. And you're wondering, it's the fruit of the curse. You with me? So deeper than stress is fear. Deeper than fear is condemnation. Let, let's, let's bring a, a, a more working biblical definition of condemnation to help us. Are you with me? You okay? God's going to liberate. I'm, I'm telling you this morning, he's going to liberate us. In some, in, in, some of us in this room, we've been battling. We don't know what. We've been battling the wrong battles. We've been fighting the fruit up here instead of dealing with the root down here. Condemnation he, is, is, a, is an expression of very strong disapproval. You ever feel that way? That's what Adam felt. You see, God didn't say he was disapproved of, God, uh, uh, of Adam. I mean, God obviously, you know, had said, don't eat off this tree. God never said, I'm upset at you like that. You created this scenario. As a result, this is going to happen. I gave you the option. It's an expression of very strong disapproval. The action of condemning someone to a punishment, sentencing, condemnation always demands a payment for all failures. For all failures. In fact, if you're consistently expecting to be punished, then you're already under condemnation. you got to remember this, that God punished sin in the body of Jesus before you ever even did anything wrong. He took care of you. And what would bind you before you ever even did anything wrong, before you were ever even born. That's too good to be true, isn't it? How come I don't have to pay for my stuff? Because Jesus paid for it. He fulfilled the debt payment you couldn't make. So why you try to keep paying your debt by living under condemnation? A lot of us are paying a debt that doesn't even exist. We're giving bank our spiritual money and Jesus is like, I already paid the bank off. You're just, you're just putting more money into an already corrupt system. I'm using that as an analogy. Already corrupt system. You're just putting money. I've already paid it off. You don't have a mortgage anymore on your spiritual house. I paid off your house for you. I've set your house free. See, condemnation and accusation are one and the same. They work together. They work together. An accusation can be... Oh, you're going you're gonna to fail. You see, you, you've already failed. See, you haven't prayed enough. That's why God's not answering you. I, I, I battled with this. I remember when I, I, my wife was going through hell in her body years ago. 
And we were seeing people in our meetings with traveling around the world he- healed of the same issue my wife was battling with. And I felt this warring accusation. You see, you're not praying hard enough for your wife. You don't care about your wife. You're not fasting enough for your wife. Why are people, other people being healed, but your own wife is struggling? And this looks so weird because you're like praying for people to be healed in, in, from the a sickness and they're being healed. And yet your own wife at home is struggling and she's in bed. And, and this warring lie would come against me off and on, off and on, off and on, accusation. You're not good enough. You're not praying enough. You're not. And if you listen to that lie, you come under condemnation. And when you come under condemnation, you move into fear. Maybe that is true. Move into stress. Oh my gosh, I can't handle this. And then everything else that you see on that screen becomes your reality. In Hebrew, in Hebrew, the devil's name, Satan's name in Hebrew is ha Satan, which literally means the accuser. It means the accuser. What identifies him, he is, his very being, his whole assignment is to accuse and bring false condemnation where it does not belong. And his whole tactic is to convince you of something that's not even true. Because he has no authority. His hands are tied. So imagine this. When he comes and tempts you, he comes like this. He's not grabbing you. He's just whispering in your ear. Yeah, I see you're going to be sick the rest of your life. Yeah, see, this is a result of all the bad things that you did when you were 18 years old. You see, you see, this is why nobody loves you. Every time you come into a church, everybody rejects you. No one really cares. They all, they're all a bunch of fake people at this church. They, they don't like you. So don't come back to this church because they're not, they just ain't, they just ain't they're talking behind your back. They're gossiping behind you. They're, they're, all he's doing is he's, he's speaking to your ear. You start believing it, you move into fear because you're condemned, you get stressed out, and that's your life. This is how the enemy works, and we're exposing it for what it is right now because God wants to liberate us this morning. You see, an accuser is a, a prosecutor at law. He's an expert in condemning you, pointing out your faults, pointing out your failures. A prosecutor never really points out the good things. In your life. They're there to prosecute you, to mess you up. You're a bad mom. You just yelled at your kids. Your kids are going to live the fruit of that the rest of their life. They're going to have a memory just like you did of your mom yelling at you. They're, the rest of that, you hear that, that accusing voice? That accusing voice? You hear that accusing voice? You're a horrible father. Look at your example. You're a horrible father. You're a horrible friend. You didn't even call your friend on that on his birthday. There's no way you're ever going to have a good friendship after this. You're a horrible friend. Fear. You want to hide. Put a fig leaf. False covering. False protection. Fruits of the curse. Revelation 12 verse 10. Let me show you that the devil is an accuser. It says, for the accuser of our brothers, speaking of Satan himself, and sisters has been thrown down to the earth, the one who accuses them before God day and night. He's always accusing you. Verse 11, but they have defeated him by the blood of the lamb and by their testimony. The prophetic picture of the testimony of who God has been to you up until now, knowing that you have been set free, that you have been cleansed from all unrighteousness, that right now you are righteous. God looks at you through the eyes of his son and sees the blood of Jesus on you. And you will overcome these accusations by knowing that you have been set free and that when he looks at you, you're righteous. It's a mindset. It's a mindset. 2 Corinthians 3 verse 9 says, For the ministry of condemnation had glory. It worked for a time. But the ministry of righteousness or reconciliation exceeds much more in glory. In other words, Jesus came, Paul is incur- basically making the statement, Jesus came to introduce a better way. This worked for a season. It had a measure of fruit, of protection for a season, but ultimately it was killing us off. Ultimately you, would ne- you, were, you were never able to fulfill because the Bible says even if you break one law, you've broken them all. 
And so Jesus says, hey, guess what? It's even more impossible. Now, if you even lust in your heart, you've committed adultery. I'm just showing you that it's moving from just outside behavioral acts to inside perspectives and motives. And you're never going to be able to fulfill that payment. So I'm going to die on the cross one time and for all to pay, to make the payment to the bank that you could never make. You're like, wait a minute, this is such good news. Exactly, that's why it's called good news. It's not bad news. It's too good to be true type of news. So we go back to our original passage, Romans 8 verse 1. Therefore, there is now no condemnation. There is never a place in Christ post-crucifixion and resurrection where you stand condemned. There's never a place post cross and resurrection in Christ, in your relationship, where you stand condemned. Therefore, there is now no condemnation. If we can get a hold of the truth of what Paul is trying to say, which is scandalous by nature, which offends every religious person out there that says, listen, you cannot and will not and won't be able to work for any sort of righteousness. He already established it for you on, his, on your behalf. There's no, if you can get this, I'm telling you, it will deal with the fear because God has not given us a spirit of fear. It will deal with the stress. And you'll start seeing Galatians 5 begin to happen as a byproduct. You'll be more patient. You'll be more joyful. I've been soaking in this revelation all week. I'm like reminding myself, oh God, like there's areas in my life where I, you, it's easy to forget. It's easy to forget. Like I am not condemned. I don't stand condemned. And, and all of a sudden, it, it like this is joy of like, man, like my perspective just gets renewed. And that's why Paul said in Romans 12, be transformed by the renewing of your mind. you got to get your mind fixed on things above, renewed every day into this stuff. Because when you do, I'm telling you, fruit will happen, Galatians 5. Fruit will happen. You won't produce it. He'll produce it in you and through you. You'll be that branch that doesn't have to work for it. You're disconnected and you're producing fruit. So good. I'm almost done, but I want to I read a few more things. Can I read a few more things to you? Uh, the scripture is illuminating you right now. I can see it. I can feel it in the room. The scripture is illuminating you. Romans 5, verse 20 to 21. God's law was given so that all people could see how awesome they were. No, how screwed up they were. It's the law of sin and death for a reason. It points out your faults. It's condemning. It's condemning. You can't do it. You're not good enough. You'll never be able to fulfill all the law. It will not happen for you. You need a savior to bring you out of this mess. God's law was given so that all people could see how sinful and screwed up they were. But as people sinned more and more, God's wonderful grace became more abundant. So just as sin ruled over all people and brought them to death, now God's wonderful grace rules instead, giving us right standing with God and resulting in eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. This is not license to sin so you get more grace. Because if you read the next chapter in verse 6, the Roman, the, the, the Roman mindset was, okay, fine, let's just go and, la like Mardi Gras, let's go and lavish our lives and get the priest to you know, cleanse us with ash on our forehead on Ash Wednesday. And let's just go indulge so we can get more grace. That's not how it works. Actually, Paul rebukes that thinking and says, guys, no, 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 you've got it all backwards. You will live righteous as a byproduct when you get a hold of this message of grace and a hold of this scandalous message that's too good to be true. When you get a revelation that it was God's law that brought you to the end of yourself, Galatians 3 verse 24, it says the law was a tutor to bring you to the end of yourself, which really is the beginning of yourself. The law brought you to the end so grace could be your beginning. It says, therefore, the law was our tutor to bring us to Christ, that we might be what? Justified by our works? No, by faith. By right believing, we connect ourselves to the right root. By wrong believing, we somehow try to hold on to two roots, and one doesn't even exist anymore. It's been uprooted from your life. But what ends up happening is the enemy convinces you it's still there, and so you hold on to something that doesn't even exist and produce the fruit that it used to produce. 
that God has already set you free from. Because Romans 6 verse 14 says, sin is no longer your master. It's no longer your master. You, for you no longer live under the requirements of the law. Instead, you live under the freedom of God's grace. God wants to set us free. Put the slide back up. A slide of the tree. I just wanna, I'm going to close in a second here. But I want that picture to... Take a picture of it if you need to. I want this picture to be in your mind. And I want us to stop trying to attack the fruit up here. Let's start dealing with the root down there. Let's not even start at stress or fear. Let's start at therefore, now, there is no condemnation. I have been set. Let's start there. Let's start there. If we start there, all the fruit will begin to shift and change as a byproduct in our life. Galatians 5 will become your lot and your inheritance. All of a sudden, joy, peace, patience, kindness, self-control, gentleness, all these things will begin to make manifest in your life. You don't need something to sedate you. What you need is to deal with condemnation in your life where you feel like you're not good enough and you can't do it and you're a failure. And you see, you're not a good husband. You're not a good father. You're not a good leader. you got to deal with that at its root. There is no condemnation and that condemnation it comes from the accuser himself who accuses you before God day and night reminding you of your past and your present issues but you know what Isaiah says an amazing thing prophecy in Isaiah about the blood of Jesus God has forgiven you past present and future and he remembers your sin no more you remember it he doesn't remember it. It's too good to be true. It's too good to be true. When you've, when you've let him into your life and you come under the freedom of God's grace, he remembers your sin no more. But you know what the enemy does? He reminds you of your sin. Reminds you of your junk. He accuses you, see? You see, you've never really been free. Sin really is not really not your master, you see? Sin really is your master, you see? How you can't kick this thing and you start fighting it, but you fight it at a leaf level, at a branch level. You're fighting it up here, trying to put more laws and guidelines, disciplines in your life up here instead of dealing with the root down here. That's what the law does. It's the law of sin and death. <clears throat> As I close, you know what's really interesting? Jesus the week he came into Jerusalem, he had his triumphal, triumphant entry into the beginning stages of him dying on the cross for humanity. He comes in, they're all like, Hosanna, Hosanna, laying down palm branches, everybody. The very people that celebrated him were the very people that ended up persecuting him and putting him on the cross. And, 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 and they were welcoming him. He was riding on a donkey, you know. And uh, he comes in and, and uh, he, he's basically getting ready to do his thing. He's getting ready to lay down his life. I mean, it's about to go down. A lot of challenges are about to be ahead of, are about to happen in his life. There's, there's, there's some key moments that happened when he came into the to Jerusalem. But the two very important things that often people will overlook, I think one of the two most important things that he did have great significance. The first thing he did was he went into the temple. Remember what he did? There's a bunch of people in temple courts that were selling and trading and merchandise they shouldn't have been selling. And they had, he's called it this. He, they, they turned the house of God into a den of thieves. And he came in. Remember what he did? He, he, in, a, in a spirit of self-righteous, like a righteous, holy anger in a sense. It doesn't say anger, but he, you could tell he like was about to throw down on these guys. And he came in. He flipped the tables. Remember that story? But the, the, the phrase, I love the phrase that's used. It's like when he did that, it says that he cleansed the temple. Who are we? The Bible says that we are a temple. We are the temple of the Holy Spirit. He was, there was a foreshadowing happening about what was going to take place through the scandalous message on the cross and through his resurrection. He cleanses the temple. He cleanses the inside of the house. I'm not majoring any longer, guys, on the outside like the law did. The law majored on your behavioral patterns. Now I'm majoring on the inside. I'm introducing a new law to the place where even if you lust in your heart, you've committed adultery. I'm introducing a new way. It's from the inside out that makes you unclean, not that from the outside in. So don't worry about the food that you're eating. I can go on and on about this. Paul talks about this in Romans multiple times. 
Jesus cleanses the temple from the inside out. And know the very th- next thing that he does? Watch this. Matthew 21, verse 18. Now in the morning, as he returned to the city, he was hungry. And seeing a what? Oh, wait a minute. Okay, I'm about to change the game. Do you remember how it all began? Do you remember how it all began from the beginning? You remember the, 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 the fruit that was so glorious and Eve was like, man, I want, I want that. It, it's, it's fruit to make one wise. I, that's what it says. I, I want that. I can't, I can't. Because, you know, the word iniquity, which is what happened when she took that fruit, is what happened to all mankind. We were born into a state of, of iniquity. When you break the word iniquity down based upon the Hebrew letters that all draw a different picture, it actually means this. Whatever your eye hooks into multiplies into your life. So whatever, so iniquity in and of itself is whatever your eye hooks into will multiply through you. And the enemy knew if he could get her eyes on that tree, he could hook inside of her the spirit of iniquity so that everybody born after her would be born into that same DNA of iniquity. And then we would need a savior to get us out of that place and recalibrate our spiritual DNA. Which is why John 3 says we're born again. We're born one time. We've got to be born again through the second Adam who died because the first Adam messed it all up for all of us. So the second Adam, who's Jesus Christ, had to come so we could give us a reborn experience and change our spiritual DNA because we were all born not in the image of God, in the image of Adam, and born into a spirit of iniquity. So we have freedom, the freedom of God's grace. You're following me. So, so, so the fruit was there, and he was like, oh my gosh, and, and her eye was hooking into it because the enemy knew it would multiply into all humanity as sin and iniquity. We'd all be screwed up after her. So this happens. She takes this fig. The very next thing that takes place when they do that, they're all of a sudden aware of things they were never aware of before. There's a consciousness of sin, because the Bible says in First Corinthians 15, the strength of the law, or the strength of sin, is the law. There's this pressure. There's this thing. I'm aware now, all of a sudden. So I got to hide myself. I'm going to use this fig leaf. I'm going to use this fig leaf. Do you know that in in Palestinian culture, the sign of that there would be figs on a tree were always if the leaves were already there. The leaves would grow first and then the fig, not the other way around. So when Jesus saw, passed by a tree that had fig leaves, he assumed there would be fruit. Because usually there was. And under the ministry of condemnation, there was a level of glory according to Scripture. But Jesus came to change the game on that. I bet you, I wonder if he's walking along and he, he's about to, he cleanses the temple and he's walking along and he's like, he's reminded. All the way back to the beginning. I remember this thing. I remember what this did. This was the false covering. This is what condemnation brought all humanity. They hid themselves from God. They separated themselves from God. And so you guess what? Guess what? I am becoming the curse. I'm becoming the curse. And just a few days from now, hung on a tree so that every curse in people's lives would be broken and so to to prophetically foreshadow what I'm about to do I'm going to curse this fig tree I'm fulfilling today the requirements of the law I am changing the game I'm introducing a new way so he cursed the fig tree you will never produce fruit again that's what he said and it withered immediately for it to not produce fruit he had to go to the root See, he was prophesying, I'm dealing with condemnation today. You want your house cleansed? You want to live free on the inside? I got to deal with the fig leaf that you're putting on in front of you, hiding yourself from me in shame and guilt because you listened to the accuser. I'm prophetically declaring the end to condemnation. It says, let it no, let no fruit, verse 19, let no fruit grow on you ever again. And immediately, the fig tree withered away. Isn't that amazing? I love what he says next. He says, listen, guys, this is nothing. He even calls, he says, like, you can say to a mountain, move, and it will move. But you know what? This is actually one of the biggest mountains in front of your life right now, is living under a spirit of condemnation. 
It's so big you don't even see it. It's a mountain that goes beneath the soil of your life. So you think you're dealing with this? You think your battle's up here? No, your battle in this season is down deep in the soil of your life, dealing with these mindsets that come from condemnation. Why don't you stand up with me? Just close your eyes just for a second. Just close your eyes because I feel like first and foremost, Jesus wants to deal Jesus wants to deal with the root. I'm telling you, there are people in here right now. It's with every eye, every eye closed in this room. There are people in here right now. And you know, you know there's fruit right now in your life. That's manifesting, that's happening. That you can identify with on this tree. I believe with all my heart in this room that his grace is here to set you free. And just like Paul pronounced in his letter to the church at Rome, in Romans 8 verse 1, Therefore, there is now no condemnation. Jesus is here to deal with that condemnation at the root. At the root. At the root of its core. At the root of its core. The accusations that have come against you. Let's say you have to be something you're not to be accepted. That's coming from a root of condemnation. You have to be something that you're not to be accepted. You have to be a certain way. You have to please a certain way. And if you don't do that, you're not accepted and you'll be rejected. And so what you end up doing is you begin to attach your root system of freedom to a root system that has been destroyed at the cross and then you begin to live out a reality that doesn't even exist in your life. And Jesus wants to break that experience today of that fruit that's on your tree. He wants to deal. He wants to attack that fruit by dealing with the root. And so in Jesus' name, I pray, God, for deliverance in this room this morning. I pray for a deliverance, God. I pray for a freedom. Come on, right now. Lift your hands up. If that's you, I know all of us at some level, at some level, need freedom. God, we pray right now that there, you break, you break the spirit, you break the spirit, this accusing, this accusing lie, you break off the lie, 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 the lie of condemnation, the lie, the lie that I have not been set free. I declare Romans 6 that sin is no longer your master any longer, but you live under the freedom of God's grace in Jesus' name. Deliver us right now, God. Deliver us. Deliver us right now, God. Deliver our mindsets. Deliver our mindsets. Renew our thinking right now. Renew our thinking right now. Renew our thinking right now. God, illuminate, illuminate, illuminate right now. For many of us in this room, we're like, wow, I've been believing a wrong gospel. I've been believing a wrong message. I've been believing, even though you thought you were free, maybe you've realized today you're not as free as you could be. You're not as free as indeed as you should be. In this moment, I believe God is shifting our perspective. He's giving us a higher perspective in Jesus' name. Father, we thank you for what you're doing right now. And I pray that you bring healing right now. Bring healing, God. Bring healing, bring healing, bring healing right now. Produce the fruit like joy, self-control kindness, gentleness in our life. God, bring healing. Bring healing to sickness in our bodies right now. Sickness in our bodies. Sickness that's caused by stress from fear, but ultimately at the root of condemnation. God, we break the spirit of sickness and infirmity in our bodies in this room right now. We command that sickness to leave our body. Come on, sing it. Sing it.
moment is let Jesus into our life in every area. Maybe you don't know what would happen to you if you were to die today. Let me just tell you that you have already been set free. The invitation has already been made. It's been mailed to your spiritual house. All you have to do is open it and say, I accept. All you have to do is say, Jesus, I accept your forgiveness. I receive your forgiveness. Romans 10 says, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, he is God, and believe in your heart that he was raised from the dead, everything will change for you. All you have to do is receive that invitation into your life. And I want to give you an opportunity this morning. I want us to all together just say, say, Jesus, I believe that you are the real deal. I believe you are God. I'm saying yes to you today. I'm receiving forgiveness.